Good evening, everybody. Um, firstly, thank you for joining us today for, for this webinar. And, and as you can see on the screen, we will be talking about moving to uh, living in Spain. So um, a, a bit of a difference there. Um, for, for those already living in Spain, congratulations. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're loving it here. And, and for those who are looking to move there, hopefully this will provide a lot of kind of information that you need to make that journey. So there'll be some information that, that will be useful for some, some of the others, and the majority of the information should cover kind of both of you. Um, so we'll start the webinar shortly. Um, just as a, a very short introduction, my name is Matt Denfold, advisor and director here at Fiducian Wealth, and, and with me today is, is Paul Career, our managing director. Um, you have the facility to, to ask us questions, and we'll be doing the question and answer session right at the end. Um, so feel free to submit those as, as we go on. Um, maybe better to do it now rather than a, a kind of last minute rush. And, and any questions that we have at the end, we'll, we'll be able to pick up and, and hopefully answer very clearly for you. So um, what I'd like to do is just give you a quick rundown of, of what we're going to cover today. So Fiducial Wealth Management, Paul will, will give an introduction to, to who we are. Then we will cover the UK side of this. This includes um, the issue of UK domicile. We will cover, for those who are looking to relocate, visas, um, and then the understanding of, of taxation in Spain, taxation of pension income specifically, and tax planning opportunities that, that you can take advantage of. We have a few frequently asked questions that we will answer um, in section four. A little bit more key advice for, for those looking to move uh, already here. And um, at the end, we will cover the, the roadmap. And finally, we get to that Q&A session, which, um, which you should be prepared for. So um, before we get into the, uh, all of it, Paul, um, as, as one of the founders, can you please introduce yourself and, and finish your wealth management? Good afternoon. Um, by way of a background, I started my career in the Inland Revenue in 1984. I transitioned into financial services in 1989, and I've been working in financial services, private banking, and the wealth management sector now for 33 years. I'm a chartered banker by profession, and as Matt alluded to earlier, I co-founded Fiduciary Wealth in 2007, together with my partners, the owners of the longest standing law firm in Gibraltar, founded in 1892. Besides having legal roots, we also we also a member firm of NGI Worldwide. NGI was founded and established, in fact, it's one of the oldest accountancy networks. It was founded in Surrey in England in, in 1947, and it's a top 20 ranked global accountancy network. Today they have more than 11,000 professionals across 460 uh, locations, 100 countries driving over $1 billion in revenue. So we are quite quirky in the sense that we are wealth management practice, but as I said, with some legal and accountancy and tax consulting groups. Our mission is to positively uh, shape the wealth of the expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice. I'm a great believer in the need to engage in a broader dialogue to develop, develop deeper relationships and provide more client-focused solutions. Um, I'm also, I also happen to be a strong advocate of the need to offer experts uh, holistic, tailored and impartial advice which stands the test of time. Okay, thanks Paul. Um, I think there's one more question, though, and, and it's something that I imagine people here today might want to know, and, and something I get asked quite a lot, actually, is um, when it comes to serving clients abroad, what would you say the, the kind of key differences are about fiduciary wealth? Uh, that's a really good question, Matt. Um, uh, well, uh, let me go back in time. I was recently invited to join a panel of speakers 
in London to discuss the financial and lifestyle considerations of moving abroad. And I happened to be on a panel with a direct competitor uh, who was asked the same question that you're asking me now, basically to introduce themselves and to explain about the company. And his speaking was all about the company's growth story, and there was an internal focus, but not one word about the clients they serve, which surprised me. I mean, let me say, that's not a criticism, far from it. Uh, they have built a very successful business looking inwardly, and, and good luck to them. But it did make me think about our purpose and our values and what makes us different as a firm. And I mean, what I concluded, because I was lucky enough to be the last speaker on the panel, is that we have a family office approach offering a highly personalized service to, in which each and every client relationship is highly valued and matters to us. So relationships are at the heart of everything we do. And we always have a long-term focus. So we, we try and put a lot of energy into preserving our clients' legacy, not just for their futures, but for the futures of those that depend on them. We are very passionate about possibly shaping the wealth of the expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice. Everything starts with tax, and ethics is also um, very important for us. We always do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. I mean, our mission is very simple, Matt. Our mission is to help expats and their families. And um, if I had to sum it in four words in terms of what we do, forget about our products and services. It's all about providing service. It's about helping clients. It's about caring about each and every relationship uh, that, that we serve. And it's about supporting our clients. And I know to some it might sound terribly simplistic, uh, but that's who we are and what we stand, what we stand for. We are quite proud of that. Yeah, no, I'd agree, Paul. I think it's, it's nicely different. And, and I think that's, yeah, what we're very proud of, as, as you say. So um, we talk on, we move on to the UK exit. And, and um, some of you may say, oh, I'm in Spain. This doesn't interest me, but, but uh, interesting it may do. And, and of course, we're not talking about a physical exit, um, but we're, we're talking about what happens when you leave the UK and, and, and what is important at, at this stage. So, um, firstly, Paul, the, the, how does someone make sure that they leave the UK in, in a clean way and, and don't we trigger UK tax residency? Yeah, well, there are many different factors which one needs to determine. Um, which, which actually determines whether you are deemed to be a UK tax resident or not. And clearly, the number of days that you physically spend in the UK during the tax year is, uh, is an important consideration, but it is not the only consideration. Um, you need to think and consider the patterns of your presence in the UK and your connections to the UK, which covers a, a range of issues, whether it's family, property, working life, or even social connections. It is the UK State of Residency Test 2013, which allows you to plan the date in which you become non-resident in the UK, and actually determines how many days you can spend back in the UK without accidentally retriggering residency. Of course, you know, if a client comes to us for advice, we would always say that it's advisable to exit at the end of the UK tax year on the 5th of April, because it's cleaner. Um, but let me say that when you exit one country for another, that the tax years will vary and it's never absolutely clean. So in the UK, as most of you know, it runs from April to April. In Spain, it runs on a calendar year basis. So inevitably there's a degree of overlap, but I think it's much better if you plan, plan from a UK tax perspective and try to um, exit on, on the 5th of April. Um, however, you may decide to split the tax year between the UK and Spain, and there are some specific situations where the split year rules will apply automatically. So the three 
uh, specific situations are when you're starting full full time employment abroad, when your spouse or partner is starting full time uh, work overseas, same thing. And thirdly, if you cease to have a UK home. In those three specific situations, the UK uh, tax authorities does allow for a split year um, for split year rules to um, to apply. Um, okay, so you, you start the new job, you, you make a kind of clean exit from the UK, and then, then you start to move in Spain from that day. No, I mean, it's advisable to start on a clean year basis, so 5th of April, but there are specific situations where the split year rule applies, ah, of course. which means that you don't have to exit on the 5th, that you don't um, encounter any difficulty, difficulties with HMRC, and those specific situations, if you have um, employment overseas or your spouse or partner has, a, has employment uh, overseas or thirdly, you cease to have a UK home. And that those specific situations, you can sever your UK residency halfway through a tax year and you don't have to look back to see if HMRC is going to try and claim that you're tax resident the whole year. Okay, perfect. That makes sense. So it's a bit of a subtle uh, difference there. And uh, staying on the UK side, because uh, again, this is something that I believe is, is often overlooked and, and um, uh, often is a huge mistake when they do. The, the UK domicile, and, and Paul, how does the UK domicile affect uh, UK inheritance tax? Yeah, well, well, if I go back a step, I mean, the good news is, is as you know, Matt, that um, in Spain, well, when I say in Spain, let me caveat that statement in Andalusia, because Spain's autonomous regions all have, may have different tax rules with regards to inheritance tax. But the good news is that in Andalusia, there's no succession tax applied, tax applied with the first 1 million euros. Um, and then if your total assets exceed 1 million, then the succession tax is only 1% uh, over the excess. Now that sounds fantastic. Uh, the bad news is that you're likely to remain exposed to UK inheritance tax, um, as this is based on the concept of domicile of origin as opposed to residency. And domicile of origin is something you acquire at birth. Normally it's taken from your father. Um, and whilst you can claim and acquire a domicile of choice by settling in a new country with intention to stay there permanently, and uh, this is fraught with difficulty and there's no fixed rules and the burden of proof as far as HMRC are concerned will always fall on you as the individual to prove that you've acquired a new domicile of choice. In my experience, even if you were to prove that you've acquired a domicile of choice, it's not uncommon for Brits to return to the UK, either one, temporarily, due to ill health, in which case it would re-trigger your domicile of, of origin and you fall back into the UK tax net for inheritance tax, or you decide to move back permanently following the death of your spouse. We see, we see that all the time, Matt, as you, yes. as you know, it's quite common. Uh, so whether it's temporary for a year, that it triggers tax domicile, assuming you've managed to shed the UK domicile, which is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And then, um, yeah, and then it'll return, you return. So that's something to keep in mind, not only to plan from a Spanish succession tax perspective, but you know, consider that you're likely to remain UK tax domicile for IHT. I mean, theoretically, Matt, you, you can avoid UK IHT after five years of non-UK residency, but in practice, it's quite complicated because you've got ties like business interests, social and family connections, property ownership, and even something as innocuous as intentions is enough for HMRC to deem that you will remain UK domicile. So it is not easy to get rid of, and there's no guidance. It, it, it only happens posthumously. So you know you won't be wise, and then you'll be none the wiser. Um, but you can lose a chunk of your wealth to the UK taxman. 
and even in significant ties can be challenged. I mean, HMS, HMRC have been known to rely on the most tenuous of grounds to dismiss claims that uh, Brits have acquired a domicile of choice. I mean, the most high profile case, Matt, is the now deceased Welsh actor Richard Burton, uh, which I'm sure you all know. I mean, he lived in the US for many years and then decided to move to Geneva in Switzerland in 1957. He spent the next 27 years in Switzerland before passing away in 1984. The UK tax authorities made an inheritance tax claim on his estate on the grounds that he never actually relinquished his UK domicile, notwithstanding the fact that he had left and severed his ties for 30 years and he had received Packer advice on how to do it properly. And they successfully claimed that since he purchased a burial plot in Wales, he retained emotional ties and always intended to return to the UK. So that's the all-encompassing clause. What were his intentions, the intentionality? And apparently, his request to be buried in a red suit, I guess the red dragon, and with a copy, you know, you might find it amusing, of Dylan Thomas' poems, uh, was certainly didn't help his case. As a result of that, his worldwide estate, which was five million pounds at the time, which was a lot of money in 1984, was subject to a UK inheritance tax bill of 2.4 million. Now, the good thing um, is that being a, uh, a non-UK tax resident and being an expert does provide you with plenty of tax planning opportunities to restructure your assets to either mitigate UK inheritance or possibly, depending on your personal circumstances, even completely eradicate and avoid any liability to UK inheritance tax. And this is an area where clearly we can provide uh, strong advice. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just to go back on, on the, because for me, the UK inheritance tax is, is clear, but more than clear in the sense that we, we kind of know how it works, but you clearly have to do a lot of preparation because the, the rules are presumably uh, muddy on purpose at like HMRC can catch us. But the, the Spanish succession tax, obviously we're talking about Andalusia today because this is local to us and, and it changes for regions. Um, but, but those, um, so there's very generous allowances, but that's only for direct um, direct descendants. Is, is that is that well, like the rules become muddy. Okay. You have to look at descendants they have yeah. and and the allowances that apply and so on. Okay. So, so it's, it's, it's not straightforward, but, but it's quite generous, I would say. No, it's extremely generous. Because if you think of the threshold of a million, and, and quite often if you look at British experts, they are leaving their estate to the surviving spouse. In not in all instances. Yeah. And and that's why you know individuals should seek advice. And we look at the personal circumstances, but more often than not, it's a direct descendant. No? Yeah. So that is, you know, a spouse or, or children. Okay. And I think those are deemed uh, to be direct Correct. and treated very favorably. Correct. And, and so we also have this conflict where, so in the UK, it's based on your domicile, and in Spain, it's based on your residence. Correct. So you could get caught with both. Well, you could be caught with both. That's actually a very good question because there's no, even though there's a double taxation treaty between Spain and the UK, it remains silent on the issue of inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. So it means that because of that, because they remain silent, that double taxation treaty doesn't talk about taxing rights. It means that Spain, based on Napoleonic uh, rules, will tax it on residency. The UK, with its own Anglo-Saxon model, will do it on the concept of domicile, and there's no there's certainly no set of so are you likely to be taxed in though? No, probably not, but it becomes very complicated. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so we move on to the next stage and, and we, we want to uh, sorry, um, briefly touch on visas. Um, as I said at the start, some of you are already in Spain, so so um, thankfully you don't have to worry about this. 
Um, and, and those who established their residency pre-Brexit, um, it was, as far as Spanish bureaucracy goes, a relatively easy process. But um, now in, in the um, post-Brexit landscape, um, for those who, who do not have access to an EU passport or, or uh, uh, UK nationals, we, we need a visa to, to be able to um, reside in, in, in Spain. So, so to cover those briefly, and, and there are two main visas that, that um, we come across the, the, the most and we help people with. The, the first is the Golden Visa Paul, um, and, and the Golden Visa doesn't actually require full residency. Um, you only really need to travel to, to the country, I believe, one day a year to, to renew the, the, the um, visa. Of course, then taxation plays into it, and if you're not spending time in, in Spain, then you may not trigger tax residency. Um, but Golden Visa opens up the opportunity for you to come and go to Spain as and when you want, which we've lost. Um, the main condition with the Golden Visa is, is that you need to make an investment in, in Spain. The most common of which is, is real estate, um, and you have to invest half a million euros. Now that can be split between one or more properties, um, but it has to be mortgage free, or at least you have to own uh, above half a million in, in assets uh, uh, above that. Um, with the Golden Visa, a lot of people use it as a route to permanent residency, so after five years, you can get permanent residency and, and, and after 10, citizenship so um but for those who, who are looking for a, a, a maybe slightly less expensive route we, we have the non-lucrative visa and this is called the passive income visa and, and i guess that nickname speaks for itself in, in the sense that you have to be able to demonstrate that you have passive income um to sustain your life in in, in spain so when we're talking passive income, we're talking pension income, uh, maybe rental income from a UK uh, property or portfolio, dividends uh, um, of, of investment income. Now, the amount that you need to demonstrate, and, and this tends to increase year on year, it currently stands at €27,792. Euros, um, with an, an additional €6,948 Euros um, for your spouse or your children. And, and when we talk children, that will have to be children under the age of 18, you know, are deemed to be dependent on you. Um, so with the, the non-lucrative visa in, in Spain, the, 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 big, um, the big thing with that is, is you're not allowed to work. And, and it's a bit of a misconception, but you're not allowed to work in, in Spain or the UK. So people are, are trying to look at this as, as a route to remote working. It's, it's not the case. It's, it's really aimed at those either in retirement or maybe those who, who own your own company who aren't involved in the day-to-day -day winning of the business and, and can enjoy dividends from that. For both visas, you, you do need a clean criminal record comprehensive health insurance and, and for the non-lucrative visa you need to be able to demonstrate that you have accommodation for, for you and, and your family. Now there are a couple of other visas which, which are less common. There's the entrepreneur's visa. This is for those setting up business in, in Spain but it's incredibly strict. It's, it's designed for innovative tech-driven businesses. Um, they are rather strict on the who they're looking they're, they're looking for new businesses that they don't really have in Spain at the moment. So there is a strict criteria on those poor. And there's a high, highly qualified professional visa. This is effectively a visa for those who are offered employment by a Spanish company. Um, the issue with this is, is the company to be able to grant the visa or apply for the visa for the individual. They need to be able to prove that there is um, insufficient applicants within the whole of EU, not just Spain, to, to fill that position. So it is a, it's a difficult one to do so. There are kind of rare occasions where it's, it's very niche, but it's, it's a tricky one. And I, I mentioned it before, but I don't know about you, Paul, but I, I see a lot of talk and, and people talking about the digital nomad visa. A lot of people rely on this. I, I see people online saying, oh, the digital nomad visa is, is coming. 
I, I don't really understand where people have got this from. It, they may be in development, but um, this is Spain we're talking about. My, my understanding, Matt, is, is that there's been a lot of talk and hot air about the digital nomad. Yep. But, but the Spanish parliament haven't really discussed or enacted the bill. Yeah. So, I mean, this was a couple of months back. So whether there's been any progress or not remains to be seen, but it's been a night on the agenda for years. And they really haven't, you know, taken the trouble to implement this digital nomad visa. No, and, and I don't think it's really priority for them, is it? As much as there's some people that would love it, this is Spain as well, it, it, it moves slowly and, and yeah, I think you're right. That was a position we were two months ago, we're in the same position now, and I'm not a betting man, but in two months' time we'll probably be in the same position, but let's see, let's see. So, um, okay, we covered that. You are now living in Spain, or you're about to live in Spain, you want to understand the, the, the taxation. Um, so firstly, okay, what, what identifies you as a, as a tax resident in, in Spain? Um, the number one rule, you spend more than 183 days in, in Spain. So just over half a year um, or more. The second rule is if you're center of vital and economic interest to in Spain. That one's overlooked some, somewhat, but effectively saying is if your family live here, you, you have your main residence here, maybe your income is generated here. Spain is your home. You might be spending more time in a, in a flat in another country, but Spain is your home and, and they would be expecting you to pay tax here. As a tax resident, you need to declare your worldwide income. It's, it's not just the income generated in, in Spain, it's, it's your worldwide income. And, and we touched on this when we um, talked about the succession tax, but a lot of taxation in Spain is, is based on the region you live in. So your income tax rates, um, the succession tax, and, and wealth tax. And, and wealth tax, I'll touch on a, a little bit more um, shortly, but it's something that we're not familiar with in the UK and, and can come as a, a shock to people. And, and it's something that you need to understand and, and plan against if, if, if possible. So I just move on the slide and, and the, the figures here you see are the, the latest tax tables. These are for Andalusia, um, the income tax and the wealth tax. The income tax works very similar to, to what we're used to in the UK in the sense that it works on a progressive tax rate. Um, there is a personal allowance, but it's, it's much lower than we have in the UK. It's, it's in the region of five and a half thousand euros. It does increase slightly if you have young children or once you, you reach the age of 65, but again, it's, it's much lower than the 12,570 we, we, we're used to in the UK. Um, all your income is, is added to that. Um, rental income from the UK, you need to pay that in the UK, but it's still added to your taxable income and, and you receive a credit for the tax um, paid in the UK, which is defined by the double taxation agreement. Um, and, and if you have UK pensions, that is added to that. Now, there is ways to kind of structure your pension income, which we will, will come to shortly. And then wealth tax. Now, wealth tax is, is something that we're not used to. The figures there are above the allowances. So um, for the majority of Spain, the allowance is 700,000 euros plus an additional 300,000 euros if you have your own in Spain, your main home. So we're talking about a, a, a mill in, in euros there. Um, and then we talk about um, capital gains. Although just to go back to, to wealth tax, it's designed on, on your overall assets, but pensions is, is a little bit of a kind of gray area with that one, isn't it? It's, it's very, very much so. I, I think there's different schools of thought on, and it depends who you speak to. You know, the problem with Spain is that there's a high level of ambiguity <clears throat> with, with regards to fiscal matters. And it depends who you speak to. Everyone seems to have a different opinion. Um, some say that it should be taxed. I certainly know that some pension arrangements weren't taxable 
until you reached normal retirement age and started drawing down. And there's uh, certainly Quattro Casas was a very prestigious um, um, tax uh, house in Spain, seems to be of the view that for certain types of pensions, uh, particularly QNAPs, and I know we are digressing a bit, uh, or whether you touch it later, but, but QNAPs, for instance, they seem to think that if, if you haven't reached normal retirement age and having drawn down the pension, then perhaps it shouldn't be uh, included uh, in the computation for Spanish wealth tax. Yeah. But there's, with regards to pension, there's two or three areas which are incredibly uh, vague, gray, and as I said, you know, giving advice is, is tricky. And I, I think uh, post Brexit, there's more than that even further, perhaps yeah. there's a differentiation between EU pensions and non EU pensions, of which, of course, the UK is non EU, but then there's still this kind of gray area that, that, that remains. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So again, with, with wealth tax, it's, it's something that advice is needed because it's, it's, it's complicated and, and it needs to be kind of clear advice because there is this kind of differing of, of opinions out there. And, and then we have um, capital gains tax. So there's no regional variation for capital gains tax. Um, it is not one fixed rate. It depends on the amount of gain that you realise in, in that year. Um, and, and investment income and, and dividends would, would come under the, the capital gains assessment as well. So that accumulates to, to work out um, the, the percentage you, you owe on that. Um, so we've covered the, the taxation um, and, and we've covered um, pensions a little bit in the sense that UK pensions will be taxed as, as part of your um, assessable income tax. But there are other options, and, and an individual does have the ability to, to transfer their pension to a QROPS, which is a qualifying recognised overseas pension scheme. And regardless of what's happened, and, and again, I, I mentioned Brexit quite a lot, but I think people are a bit unsure about what's happened, as, as many are in, in, in many parts. A, a, a British national can continue to, to move their UK pension to a, a QROPS. So for those doing that, we would recommend they use Malta. Malta has a double taxation agreement with Spain, um, which means that the pension will only be taxed in Spain. And there are many benefits to, to using a, a QROPS over retaining your UK pension. Now, one of them is, is the lifetime allowance. So in the UK, we, we have a lifetime allowance, which is currently just over £1 million. Um, and if you breach that, there's tax to, to pay 25% on, on incomes or, or even up to 55% on, on lump sums. So for those that are very close to breaching that limit, they could transfer their pension to a QROPS. As long as they're under that limit, then a test is applied then. They call it the benefit crystallization test. And, and as long as you're under that limit, the pension can transfer and then the QOPs can continue to grow above the limit. No further test applies, no further, um, no taxation on that. Another benefit, and, and I will come to the income in a little bit because again, there's, there's a bit of confusion regarding that one, but a UK pension, if, if you die, after age 75, then um, your beneficiaries will inherit your pension, but they will have to pay tax on that at their marginal tax rate. Um, this doesn't apply for QROPs. Um, you know, we, we have to be mindful of, of succession tax and how that ties in, but for example, in Andalusia, that's a little problem and not much of a problem. So you pass away after 75 and, and there's no tax liability on, on the beneficiaries. And then we talk about income from the QROPS because it is possible to take income from a QROPS via a temporary annuity. And a temporary annuity is interesting. You, you can fix it for three, five or 10 years. And the rules have been that by the use of that, only 12% of, of that income received um, is, is taxable. And, and we will cover QNOPs in a minute, which, which that worked very much for. But for the QROPs, it's, it's, and Paul, am I right? It's, it's how the 
the original pension is, is funded. Well, I mean, look, one thing, uh, there's a stricter application of the rules. You know, the rules as they stand are different to practice. One thing is practice, and another thing is how theoretically it should be treated for tax. And if you delve into Spanish tax rules, what it says is that um, they will draw a distinction between retirement savings schemes. In other words, let's say an individual were to establish a UK SIP, which they founded from their after tax savings, yeah, and they build a little pot. That would be deemed to be retirement savings. And those can avail themselves of the temporary annuities and be taxed at, at a very low rate of tax. In theory, if it's an employee sponsored scheme, in other words, you work for British Steel and you accumulate a pension and you decide to transfer that pension to a QROPS and it's employee sponsored, in other words, the employer has made a massive contribution towards the scheme. In theory, those are treated differently because it's not retirement savings. I'd rather than be taxed at the savings income rate with a deduction for annuities, it should be taxed at your marginal rate of tax. Now, having said that, Matt, I have never come across a situation where the Spanish tax authorities, maybe through uh, sheer laziness, that have actually delved into detail into the scheme and the source of funding and determined that it should be taxed at the marginal rate of tax rather than at the new rate. rates. That doesn't mean that it cannot happen. Yeah. From time to time, they look into cases, but so far, as far as I'm aware, I've never, we've never come across a single case where they've treated it differently, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that Spain, we have to be cognizant of the fact that um, that Spain does have that distinction and that it run a bit of a risk. Now, there's a bit of complexity there, Matt, because as you probably know, it is not as straightforward as that. Very often, individuals have uh, employee sponsored schemes where the employer has contributed, but so has the employee. And equally, you know, pension consolidation is rife in the UK. So it is not unusual for an individual to consolidate the pensions, and that could be a mix of employee-sponsored uh, scheme, their own retirement savings, they dump it all into their SIP, they keep it for 10 years, and then they move to spend. Now, how is that treated? Do you think they'll go back and check every scheme to the very end and then determine what was retirement savings? I doubt it. But you always have to be wary that that could happen in theory. No, I guess because on the surface, uh, there's a retirement savings Correct. and this code and, and, and funded from that. And, and even with a workplace scheme, maybe the old style defined benefit schemes is, is, is obvious where it's come from. But modern pensions is, is now a combination of our own savings and exactly. workplace savings and, and tax relief. So identifying the difference of that. Oh. Is, is, is a tricky one. So, so what we're saying is it's, it's certainly impossible for an individual to yeah. avail themselves of that beneficial tax rates. Yeah, they should be able to avail themselves. Can I um, say one other thing? Because you mentioned pension transfers. I think for those Brits uh, tuning in today, I think you have to be very mindful that some years back, I think it was 2017, the HMRC introduced an overseas transfer charge of 25% on pension transfers, on, on, which was applicable in two situations. Uh, one of them, if it was a pension transfer outside the EU? I, I think it's one, it's either, if it's outside of the EU, as long as the pension and you reside in the same country. So for example, you live in Australia and I'm Australia in Europe. Correct. Yeah. So that means that you can't be caught by the overseas transfer charge. Yeah. There was a lot of noise pre-Brexit that the UK government would tighten the rules and extend it to the EU, because the only reason they didn't do it at the beginning was because they were part of the European Union with this free movement of capital. And if they had applied an overseas transfer charge to a pension transfer into a Spanish Euros, 
or somewhere else in the EU, there would be a breach of the four freedoms, one of which is the freedom of movement of capital. Yes. There's a lot of rumors that at some point in the future, the UK might decide to extend that ban or apply that charge to pension transfers into the EU, including Spain. So I think one of the things to be very mindful of is that perhaps the window of opportunity might be closing. Okay. But, but as it stands, as it we stands, can okay. move a pension to Malta, and as long as you reside in a non-European country, it's fine for now. Okay. It's fine for now. Can I just add? I don't know whether you covered it in your presentation, but the other thing that Brits need to be mindful of is that they changed the rules in November, uh, and HLRC, together with the industry, has now placed the onus on pension trustees to determine, and, and using a, a, a traffic light system will qualify pension transfers as either green light, which they will, so regardless of anything, they will go, where do you want to transfer it here? Um, is the pension trustees in their jurisdiction which is bona fide, yes? Is the financial advisor uh, a regulated firm? Is the advice that is being given correct? Yes. Is the investment advice acceptable? Yes. Then it's green lighted. In instances where a jurisdiction which is gray or blacklisted is involved, it might be under. And if in extreme doubt, it's red and they refuse to transfer the pension. So it is not as straightforward now as it used to be. And even though the experience matter, you know it more than I do, has been, it's, it's not as bad as we thought it would be. I think we need to be mad. It's supposed to, to prevent pension scamming. The reality of it's protecting the UK pension industry. But look, we're not against regulation. We're against strangulation, which is to the detriment of the client. Yeah. But again, I go back to the same thing, but these things are becoming more complex and more difficult. And if people have UK pensions, they ought to take advantage of this window of opportunity before they tighten the rules. They might not tighten the rules, yeah, but one has to be um, consider that things may change moving forward. It's still moving parts and it's moving parts. It's, it's, it's an option at the moment and, and let's hope that continues, but exactly there is logic to why they could close it off. Yeah. To, to stop any further ones. Okay. I should add with the pension transfers as well, you, you also have an option to use um, an international SIP, which doesn't have the same tax benefits as, as a QOPS. Um, but it does allow a little bit more flexibility that we use to UK pensions and, and allows you to hold your pension in, in euros. Yeah. You can hold assets in euros. For, so for those who are now living in Spain, it, it makes a lot of sense to align their income with where we're spending our money in, in euros. So we, we touched on the QNOPS briefly, but, but without an explanation of what it is. So a, a QNOPS is... is um, quite often referred to as a sister product of a QOPS. It's a, a qualified non-UK pension scheme. Now, the big difference is a QNOPS is, is funded from a lump sum. So Paul and I talked about that um, reduced income and, and the QNOPS has no doubt with that. It's, it's, it's a kind of saving scheme, retirement saving schemes. Um, people use a lump sum to, to create this retirement savings and, and and therefore it can be paid income as a temporary annuity. So what that means is only 12% of the income is assessed for taxation. That 12% is assessed against your um, progressive tax rate. So in Andalusia, that would result in effective tax rate of between 2.2% and 5.5% depending on, on your overall income. Um, so some may say, oh, well, I've, I've got these savings, you know, why would I use the, the QNOPS? There's a few good reasons for that. Um, firstly, there's an issue in, in Spain with, with capital gains. Um, you invest in the QNOPS, any growth in there is, is free of capital gains. Now, one of the big advantages to a QNOPS, and, and people are surprised about this, and, and Paul, we talked about your domicile and, and exposure to UK inheritance tax, especially if we're struggling to cut those ties, or, or, may even return even if we don't know. Any investments into a QNOPS is immediately outside of your estate for, for UK inheritance tax. And that even applies if, if you return to, to the UK. So because it's a pension scheme, pension schemes 
aren't taxed on, under inheritance tax, and then that's a, a, an incredible bonus. What we have to add with that, though, is that QNOMS has to be set up as, as a genuine retirement vehicle. Funding must be reasonable and in line with your wealth, age, and, and future income requirements. So what do we mean by that? Well, um, as an example, we, we have an individual with, with £2 million pounds of, of assets. If they put 1.9 million of those assets in a QNOPS, that is purely a, a, a kind of IHT fudge, if you will, and, and HMRC are, are going to look at that and, and say, no, that doesn't work for us. But an individual who, who wants to build up their retirement, wants to take an income from that, has a, a, a larger state and they want to use a proportion of that, a QNOPS is, a, is an incredible um, solution to, to that. And we talk about capital gains and, and um, what sometimes we don't realize is in the UK we're, we're um, uh, they're quite generous with, with uh, the tax products. We have premium bonds, they're not taxed. ISAs, no taxation on there. We, we can use bonds and, and have 5% tax. In Spain, as soon as you leave the UK, so not just in Spain, as soon as you exit the UK, those tax advantages don't apply. The, the ISA wrapper is, is it, it doesn't apply. So if you hold a large amount of ISAs, for example, in, in the UK, and then you um, create a gain from those, then they will be taxed as, as a Spanish person. So um, Spain itself for a long time really didn't have a comparable product, and, and that's why the, the Spanish compliant bond was introduced. So this is a, a, a life insurance contract and effectively operates as a wrap up around a basket of, of funds. Um, and the beauty of that is there's no immediate capital gains. And when you take a withdrawal, only the gain element of, of the withdrawal is taxed. Um, and also as, as, as part of that, um, the bond provider works out the tax and they pay it direct to half the end of for you. Um, so to give up, um, an example of here, we, we have a bit of a diagram. So you have an investment of, of uh, 100,000 euros. It's made a nice 50% gain on that. You'd like to take 15 grand, go on a beautiful holiday or buy yourself a new car. So we've got the capital. It's split between the, the return of the capital, which in this example is, is two thirds, and the gain, which is the other third. So only the gain is taxed at the normal capital gains rates. So effectively, what we have there is an effective um, capital gains tax rate of just 6.3%, with that 950 euros paid directly to, to have to end up. If I may add, Matt, I think the, the nuances between the UK system and the Spanish one is that whereas in the UK system, as you rightly say, they give you very generous products. And in fact, they've got capital gains tax allowances as well. Very true, yeah. We always choose yeah. alien to Spain. Yeah. But what was particularly interesting is, which I find it very, very odd, but in the UK, a capital gains tax event doesn't occur unless you realize a gain. Yeah. In Spain, it's not based on, on the concept of realizing a gain. They look at your investments at the start of the year and at the end of the tax year. And even if the gain is unrealized, there is a presumption of a gain and a tax accordingly. Cool. Whether you realize the gain or not, which is why the Spanish bond, as is the QNOPS, and the QROPS for that matter, is a fantastic vehicle because within, within the, the, the structure, because it's an offshore structure, all of them are offshore structures, they're growing free of capital gains and there's no, there's no event there. So to speak, yeah. Yeah. And, and mentioning it's an offshore structure, that's uh, another interesting point. We, we talk about succession tax, which is incredibly generous in, in um, Andalusia, maybe less so in, in the region that you live in. But um, one of the succession tax um, rules are if, if the asset and the ultimate beneficiary, so you may have children, grandchildren in the UK, um, so if the assets and the individual reside outside of Spain, then no succession tax, it doesn't does come under that assessment. Correct. Good. So, um, okay, we, we move on. So, we've got, I think you have some questions for me, Paul. These are some questions. Yeah. So, yeah. um, 
So, so I have one um, overall script that golden visas, you know, golden visas in Portugal actually allow you, in fact, I only um, had that point clarified today, but it allows you to actually work in the country. Yes. Um, what about Spain? Does it work on the same basis? So a, a golden visa, yes, a golden visa allows you, you to work in Spain. Um, so that's a good um, solution. But interestingly, we, we have the, the non-lucrative visa in, in Spain and the D7 visa in, in Portugal. And in Portugal, you can work on the D7 visa as long as you have the passive income. The non-lucrative visa in Spain, you, you cannot work. And they're very strict on that. And, and, and um, the thing is with the visas as well is, is some people think, OK, I'll get my visa, I'll get my residency, then I'll start doing work. They don't know. But you have to renew your residency and you have to go through the assessment and, and you may be able to get away with that, but I'd say very unlikely, very unlikely. So um, the golden visa does give a route to, to work in, in Spain, but the non-lucrative visa no. is more strict. Exactly, exactly. And a frequently asked question that I get from, from prospective clients is, if I move to Spain, can I elect to pay my tax at the UK? Yeah, yeah. You, want I, to, I, you want the cake and you want to eat it. I, I get that one as well, Paul. So I'm, I'm not surprised that one, um, that one came forward. And, and well, the short answer is no. I mean, you, you, you can't. Um, yeah, your, your tax resident in Spain, they will expect you to, to pay tax. And, and I think a lot of people, and, and I have this before, I don't know if you've had it before, but I'm sure you have, is, is that they say, okay, you know, a lot of my income is generated in the UK, I live in Spain. I'll pay tax in my UK and, and I just won't notify the, the Spanish tax authorities. But in my experience, that's nearly impossible now. There, there's common reporting standards and exchange of information. If you're a tax resident in Spain, you, you have to declare your worldwide tax because um, HMRC have a reputation for, for tax collection, but half the end in Spain, their reputation is beyond this and, and they can be very aggressive and, and not only will you have to pay the tax code, but there will be interest on top of that and, and fines. And, and I believe the fines can be something 150% of the tax owed or, or yeah, more. So, correct. yeah, it would be naive, isn't the right word to use? It's, it's not advisable at all because you need to pay your tax in Spain. Not, not only that, I think they, um, they can go back in time. It is not, it, it is not statute bound. Yeah. That's so, a good point. So, so they can go back in time and tax you as far back as they wish. Yeah, absolutely. So not to play with that. What about UK state pensions? How are they taxed and treated? Okay, okay. so um, we talked earlier actually about exits in the UK and, and as part of that exit, you should, um, you should notify the authorities and, and um, your UK state pension will be paid gross in, in the UK, so no tax in the UK and then you pay tax in, in Spain. Um, one of the things people are fearful about is, is um, the UK state pensions benefit from the uplift every year, the triple lock. Well, there was a double lock this year, as, as people found out, but um, the double taxation agreement between Spain and, and the UK dictates that um, you continue to get that. Because there are some countries that you relocate, you continue, continue to receive your UK state pension, but it won't get that uplift. If you relocate to Spain, then you will get that uplift. Yeah. yeah. It would be a bit discriminatory, of course, yeah. you know, to, to, to base those decisions on residency, having contributed your know, yeah, yeah, tax and social insurance times for, for, for an entire working life. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but stranger things have happened. I just have one minute, one last question for you, Matt. Okay. What about doing in Spain? Okay, well, um, it is a good question and, and an important one. And, and I mean, the answer is you do need a win in Spain. If, if you are living in Spain, you have assets in, in Spain, um, you need a win in Spain. But also, if you have any assets in the UK, you need a win in the UK as well. Um, so so um, you need to cover both of those. And, and um, Spain is interesting, actually, because they have um, forced airship rules. And somebody told me, actually, this week that this came from Napoleonic times. Oh, right. Um, and, and which I didn't know, actually. So, yeah. you know, it was, we're always learning. But um, effectively, that dictates where your money goes to. 
um, when they pass away in, in Spain. So normally I, I understand that's to be two thirds of that to your children. Um, I think I, I need, I would need to check, but I think it's a third to the children, a third to the spouse, and a third of it to be determined. To be determined by the by the um, by the settler. Yeah. It's called in Spanish of libre disposición, which means that you are at liberty to decide how you uh, who, who benefits from, from your inheritance. Okay, so it's important it, that it's a third of the address that is which, that. which is why you, you want to suffer that if you, if you can. Exactly. So that's one of the um uh, not that you need an, an extra motivation, but one of the important um, important reasons to get the will in Spain and, and also one in the UK for, for your UK assets. So, um, Paul, thanks for the question. So, um, really, it's only fair if, if you allow me to ask you one okay. um, in return, but a much more comfortable. But, um, Paul, what one piece of advice would you give anyone looking to move, or maybe somebody already in Spain? Very good question. I don't think it's within the um, within the brief to cover so many different permutations. And you're quite right in saying that you can look at it from two angles. Uh, those that are moving to, which have a distinct advantage than those that are already living in. Um, but in general terms, you know, it's always a bumpy road uh, because there's a high level of ambiguity as we've spoken. Uh, with regards to fiscal matters. Um, so it's even more important in, in a country like Spain that you have a trusted advisor by your side that can make the journey easier for you and that they can ensure a smooth and seamless transition to Spain. I think when it comes to moving countries, um, failing to plan is planning to fail. And you need a timeline, you need a strategy, and you need an advisor that I can help you execute that strategy. You, you don't just move and then think, oh, what, what do I need to do here? Because then you will lose out on some of the tax benefits. And of course, if you miss some of the key steps and you're not properly advised, then that can be quite costly further down the line. You know, something as insignificant as, okay, I'll take my tax-free lump sum for my pension once I'm in Spain. Well. Spain hasn't got the concept of tax free lump sums, right? So you get taxed. So that doesn't work. So, yeah, and that doesn't really, that, that's not, you know, complicated advice. That's just a simple thing. Yeah. But you, you miss out on that opportunity. Um, so I always advise you to plan first and to move later. And, uh, and planning begins before you even consider your exit. And, and when it comes to moving countries, it's okay to be the totals. You don't need to be the hare. Um, this is not a race uh, against time. This is really about executing the strategy correctly, if I may say. Um, and if, you know, in answer to your question, because that was more of a generic response, uh, one thing I go back to the issue of UK inheritance tax. So, one good piece of advice I would give to Brits is when it comes to UK inheritance tax, it's always advisable to plan for the worst. Assume that you're going to be liable to UK inheritance tax and hope for the best. So if there's a negative posthumous de determination by HMRC, um, for whatever reason, that doesn't reduce the inheritance uh, tax uh, inheritance of your children. So, uh, it's really, really important that, you know, when you start this journey and before you exit the UK, you're already thinking about UK inheritance tax and how you're going to address this issue so that you don't uh, end up like Richard Burton with a huge IHT liability and one which you would be buried and unaware of, but, but, but you're depriving your children of, of, of the state of money that you really want to pass on to your heirs. I guess you're not there to defend yourself, are you? As no. well, so it's correct. Um, but Paul, I, I, I promised you one question and I, I think really you answered two for me then, but one additional one, if you don't mind. So you've talked about the importance of, of planning before you move and, and 
I certainly agree with that. And, and the example you made about the tax we lump sum is, is a, a really good, very simple exam, example. What about those audience things? Is it too late? Or, uh, no, no, it's, it's never too late. But, but, but the conditions have changed and you have less wiggle room. You can still, there's things that you can do because your attention might still be in the UK. Uh, you might have some retirement savings that you can restructure. I mean, very often, Matt, and you will have come across it time and time again. There's a lot of bricks that have a portfolio of uh, rental properties in the UK. Yeah. And whereas those are caught for UK IHD, you can dispose of those assets and restructure them as a QNOP, for instance, and remove them from your estate. So everything hasn't been lost. There's still options and opportunities. Yeah. But you know, but we have to be um, cognizant of the fact that you have less room to maneuver. Yeah. And there's always opportunities to, to structure things more tax efficiently. So the earlier the better. The earlier the better. But another thing, Matt, you may have come across it is that you know, literally some prints want to do a QNAPS in their in their deathbed. Yes. You know, and, and you know, trustees the world over have tighten the rules. And nowadays you have to have a QNAPS uh, set up. I mean, one stage was 85, I think it's probably 75. Right? I believe it is. Yeah. It's something that bringing down the age, because remember, it's supposed to be a bona fide retirement savings plan vehicle, yeah. not a, as you rightly put it, an IHT fudge. So you can't do it in your deathbed. You should really be planning this well ahead of time. Of course, yeah. Um, so again, timing is a lesson. Perfect, perfect. And um, so we get to the last slide, and, and um, Paul, you team you nicely there, actually, because um, we talk about the, the roadmap, and this is again all, all about planning and, and um, plan with the destination in, in mind. And, and what we mean by that is, is really thinking about where you want to be, which is to protect your assets protect the inheritance for your beneficiaries, make sure your assets are tax efficient, make sure you, you have the right status to kind of live and, and reside in, in Spain. So we recommend people follow these steps and, and I'll just run through those quickly. So it's important at the start to, to gather all the information you have and, and then review this information and, and you need to discuss what your problems are and, and concerns and, and then you can understand Okay, what are your needs and what are your requirements? Then it's all about identifying your current and future sources of income and taxation, um, establish the amount of time you, you intend to spend in the various countries. So we talk about the UK statutory test, where so that individual wants to spend their time. You um, evaluate the, the viability of what you want to do and, and consider the UK exit strategy. Again, we get to the UK statutory residency test, which, which defines that, that, that time that you've identified where you want to spend it in the other countries, which usually is people returning to the UK to, to see family. Then we look at your UK domicile and, and you need to assess, okay, what is your potential liability to UK inheritance tax and then identify the opportunities you, you have to reduce that. Then that's part of the planning stage where you can consider your residency and, and no visa options if you're not already here in Spain and, and review these as well. Understand the tax planning opportunity that comes with that relocation and, and, and really clarify the process that you're going to go through. For those looking for a visa, you, you will need to um, source a qualifying property as you require for the non-lucrative visa and, and secure mortgage finance if you're buying a property here. Um, address the health requirements you need for that and, and, um, and then apply for the, the appropriate visa. So once you've done that, you can really truly consider the impact of the change of residency on your assets and, and liabilities and then start to optimise your tax position and, and then conduct that final review of your pensions, savings, investments and, and protection policies and, and ensure these are all sufficient and, and provide continuity of cover because the tension policies is, is very overlooked, isn't it, Paul? And, and right. you may have a policy which, which works for you in, in the UK, doesn't work for you in, in Spain, and, and people right. overlook these and, and 
And the danger with that is you come to claim and you've got no cover, and, and that's, yeah. that's, that's the big problem. Um, so yeah, that, that comes to, to the end of our presentation. Um, appreciate everyone listening to us. We have a few question and answers, uh, questions that have come through. Um, so we'll just bring these down and, and um, see the questions we've got. So um, a question there from Steve. So what is the tax rate um, on a QROPS? Um, so I think we covered that and I won't go into all the detail about which pensions qualify, which don't. I, I think that's something that we need to have an individual conversation with people. Um, but if you, really, truly, your if it's a QOPS that can qualify for the temporary annuity, um, then potentially 12% of, of that is, is liable for tax. And, and then that 12% is applied to your progressive income tax rates. I mean, there's a point. The second question there from Steve, do you need to remove the full amount of the QOPS into a temporary annuity? And the answer is, Possibly no. I mean, again, this is where it becomes very grey. Some people will say that you should really take the annuity, the five-year annuity, and ring fence it within the accurops, and, and the money is segregated there yeah. to pay for the annuity. And, and then some will argue that you need an insurance wrapper within the accurops to legitimize the annuity, but. But there's other schools of thought with advice from Cuatro Casas and, and you don't, you know, a certificate from a trustee saying it's a temporary annuity is just as valid. And they take a, a more pragmatic view that you don't have to ring fence. We certainly haven't ring fenced it and, and we are, you know, against the idea of, of using a tax wrapper unless it's absolutely necessary. Absolutely. It's a very good question, actually, from Steve. No, and, and I think just to add to that, Paul, is, is that it's not like a traditional annuity where you take the whole pot and then you go buy this annuity. Correct it's not. It's, it's a temporary annuity for a short amount of time, which you say there's these yeah. different schools of thought, but you still retain your QROPs and the assets can it's continue to grow. In that. And can be invested, because it's not an annuity in the UK sense of the word where you're buying an annuity in the market. It's, it's, it's a certificate of age to say it's a temporary annuity. Correct, correct. Sarah? Sarah, yeah, so if you have Spanish residency and become a tax resident, is it better to complete the S1 form so that a UK state pension is paid in Spain? Or is it better leaving the state pension in the UK and draw as needed in, in Spain? I don't plan to, to spend more than 10 years in, in, in Spain. Um, I think Sarah, that's probably something that we need to look on an individual basis. Um, I think there's a little bit of confusion regarding that question about, you know, draw as needed in, in Spain. You, you can potentially transfer your, your, UK Spain, your UK state pension to Spain, but it's still a state pension. It's still going to pay a, a kind of fixed amount on, on these dates. It's not a, a pot that you can draw such as a private pension, but um, we, we could happily look at that as, a, as an individual case. And, and then Barry there's got a, a very simple question for us, is passive income visa the, the same as non-lucrative visa? The answer is yes, the, the, the more official name is non-lucrative visa, it's just commonly known as, as passive income because that's the, the qualifying for that. Um, Okay, and, and Barry's followed up by I work. Well, he's, he's works as a, uh, a his occupation now. I won't reveal it to everyone. Um, we did it in Spain. Even if the patients are in the UK and paying to a UK bank account, am I working in Spain? I, I think we covered that, Barry. But yeah, if, if and, and presumably when I had that question, you're referring to the non-lucrative visa. The, the rules are pretty clear on that. If you have the non to visa, you cannot work in Spain or the UK. It doesn't matter where your money is paid into, but, you're still working. But, but in Spain, if you've done 183 days, then whether you do it online or not, you're, you're, you're deriving income in, in Spain, you're a tax resident in Spain. Yeah, absolutely. And from absolutely. Tax there. Where they pay you and where the client is based is 
motivator but uh, I think your tax resident yeah your tax resident in, in Spain and, and, and that's the case okay and yeah that's not a question just somebody making a, a, a comment so it's your name no I think we've got them all yeah no so we've um yeah we've covered your questions so um I mean that tells us that we we covered most of the information you're looking for so it's, it's pleasing to hear um, we do want to thank you again for, for joining us. We hope it's, it's been useful. Um, I think a common theme that's come out of this is, is there's a lot of planning that's involved. Um, there's a lot of key differences between the taxation in Spain and in, in the UK, and um, a lot of ambiguity about what you can and can't do, and, and that's why um, we would love to speak to those who want to on an individual basis feel free to, to reach out and, and we're happily uh, uh, arrange a, a, a chat at some point. Yeah. Wonderful. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.